I think writing is desire, not a form of it. This could be a fragment from a pre-Socratic philosopher, or a post-structuralist philosopher, or one of the deathless poets from the millennia in between. But it's all of the above. Classic Eileen Miles. Though she's our most contemporary of poets, Miles has this timeless way of returning us to the essence of writing, desire, and its myriad forms. A clumsier poet, like myself, might say the same thing, only differently. Writing is not a form of desire. It is desire. But that just sounds lofty and pretentious, doesn't it? Miles gets the words in the right order, which is to say, the right form. I think writing is desire, not a form of it. Putting things in the right order is a matter of priorities. Miles, I'd say, is our great American poet of prioritization, prosodic and political. Why should work come first and pleasure afterward? Where does pain fit into the order of things? Why should this artist win first prize and that one come in last place? Why is straight life privileged over queer desire? Reading Miles makes you reconsider our society's most basic premises. Her new and selected poems, I Must Be Living Twice, and her reissued novel, Chelsea Girls, which you should totally buy, <laughs> uh, make a mesmerizing and irrefutable case for putting art before everything else. All this makes Miles sound like an argumentative poet. And in a sense, she's always already engaged in debate with herself, with the literary establishment, with the political consensus of our time. But her art never collapses into mere disputation. There is an argument for poetry being deep, she writes, but I am not that argument. Miles shows us that identity itself is a kind of argument. Call her a lover's quarrel with the world, but one that runs deeper than poetry. Life is a vow that frightens as it deepens, she writes. Her poetry deepens our sense of life, sometimes frighteningly so. Throughout, Miles' critique of social priority and her argument with the world are illuminated by a radiance, candor is another word for it, and joy. To write is a form of accounting, an approximate promise, she writes elsewhere, in the sunny mouth of time. Wait a second, I said to myself when I first read these lines. I thought that writing is desire and not a form of it. But to write is a form of accounting an approximate promise, too. How do you make these positions square with one another? You don't have to in the sunny mouth of time. You can't kill a poet, Miles reminds us. We just get erased and written on. Eileen Miles is the author of 19 books, including I Must Be Living Twice, New and Selected Poems, and a reissue of Chelsea Girls, both out in fall 2015 from Echo, HarperCollins. Her other recent books include Snowflake, Different Streets, Inferno, a poet's novel, The Importance of Being Iceland, Travel Essays in Art, and Sorry Tree. As a poet and art journalist, she's contributed to publications such as Art Forum, The New Yorker, Harper's, The Believer, Vice, Cabinet, The Nation, Paris Review, and many others. She also contributes essays to catalogs for major exhibitions, such as the Whitney and Liverpool Biennials. Miles' solo performances include Leaving New York, Life, and Summer in Russia at PS122 in New York. Her plays include Feeling Blue at Modern Art and Our Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz at, also at PS122. In 2004, she wrote the libretto for the opera Hell, composed by Michael Webster. In 2010, she created and directed her Dia Center performance piece, The Collection of Silence which involved dancers, poets, 
children, visual artists, and Buddhists in a collective public act of silence at the Hispanic Society in New York. Miles is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in Nonfiction, an Andy Warhol Creative Capital Art Writers Grant, a Lambda Book Award, the Shelley Prize from the Poetry Society of America, and a Poetry Award from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts. These days, she lives in Marfa, Texas, and New York. Please join me in welcoming Eileen Miles. I'm going to read one story from Chelsea Girls first, and then I'm going to read a bunch of poems. You look happy, I'm glad. <laughs> it's like, it was like, oh no, is that what she's going to do? <laughs> I also have a very limited edition. My, um, one of the joys of having the largest publisher I've ever had is that they, um, they ask you for things, and then they say no. So they asked me to write a, um, an introduction to Chelsea Girls, and I thought, that's so cool. And then I gave it to them, and they said, that's not an introduction. <laughs> Which, I mean, I feel like I was there, and now I'm here, and I wrote what happened in between, so how could that not be an introduction? But let's see, this is like the condom for these books. So I did... I don't know, I've been getting a lot of press lately and I feel like I keep being called a punk poet and I feel like I've done about two things which are punk and one of them is that I actually, so then I, I made a little zine of the, um, the introduction. So about four or five of you can buy them for five dollars. And then I have a poem which I'll read later which I also think is actually kind of punk. And I almost didn't get here, I've just, everybody, anybody who would listen, I've been telling this story to it, like, I was like in my, I was in Burlington, Vermont last night and I, got home and I looked on my email and they were like, you know that plane you're taking at 9.30 tomorrow morning? Well, it's at 5 now. And I was like, what? And kind of went crazy making them do the right thing. This is a story called My Couple. It's just a little poetry world gossip for those of you who like that kind of shit. I went to them because I was hungry. It was something like that. I was finally through with all the business with Chris or thought I was, and came back to New York, elated to be utterly free, and decided I would not get involved with anyone, but was simply into sex, and immediately called Yvette, who I still wanted to have sex with, and she practically hung up on me. She said, I'll call you back, but that's the absolute easiest way to get someone off the phone. I was sitting in a little black cafe table on the sidewalk on the Upper West Side, and I was sipping the tastiest vodka and grapefruit juice I have ever had in my life. It was the taste of freedom. Maybe I had two Marlboro lights left. They rattled in the box, and I was so fucking high. I was starving. I headed over to Ted and Alice's. They were usually good for a couple of bucks, and I could always get a fix on what was going on in my life. Ted would tell me, and then Alice would say something even smarter. They were the ones who advised me to go over to Grace and Keith's. They always have nice dinners, Ted said. Do they have meat, I asked. I was looking at the translucent leaves shaking in a window pot. I was practically hallucinating from hunger. It was the hardest need to satisfy. I had a million ways to satisfy my hunger on my own, usually getting credit at any one of the local supermarkets on First Ave, but I owed them all money right now. People would offer me drinks, drugs, even buy me cigarettes, but no one would feed me. And I didn't want to ask. I was 31 years old, and it was too humiliating to admit I wanted food. I wanted a steak. Well, they have money. I think they get supported by Keith's parents, and Grace gets her salary from the church. You could probably go and get whatever you wanted over there. Think you could walk in on dinner just about now. He looked at his watch. Have a pill. He bent his head towards the clear, golden pharmaceutical container that had slipped under his belly. He picked it out like a little boy. It was one of those half-green, half-speckled capsules from Dr. Sugar. I went down and called Keith. One of the weirdest things about having older work republished is that everything is about technology. Like, so I went down and called Keith, meant that it was in the day of the telephone, and their phone was turned off, and so I had to go down to the pay phone. It's just 1982, I think. He yelled, Grace, and went away for a moment and said, can you bring a six-pack? I said, no, but I can go out when I get there if you have money. It wasn't such a good introduction, but it seemed just fine with them. Dinner wasn't so great. It was pasta with vegetables, pretty boring, but since no one else was interested, I kept shoveling it down and drinking beer. I felt like I was something very interesting just by sitting there, which made me feel very comfortable and safe in the knowledge that this relationship would continue. I looked down at the poem I had been writing in my notebook when I was starved, Laramie. Here we are in Wyoming, stopping for a can of soup. 
Here we are, a string of leaves running down the window pane, green, limey, running by a bluish sky. Laney, come by and feel the breeze outside. This window, Laney, won't you please come by and put down your spoon? I was obviously losing my mind. And now I was full. I was smoking Keith's cigarettes. They were telling me all about their marriage. They had kind of fascinated me in the past. I was part of this extended family of poets, and as one of the younger ones, I had watched this generation of people just older than us trotting out their friends when they came back to New York from their various desperate attempts to have lives outside of the East Village. They all seemed kind of pathetic to me. Keith and Grace had been lovers at different times with Marie, who was central to their scene. She was its ruler, and everyone seemed to tag along with her to her next kingdom, which was really a Buddhist retreat in the Rockies, and they would have bad-paying teaching jobs there and get involved with students. Some others had stuck around New York and become art writers, like my former friend Pat. I guess I'm fascinated by anyone's history, and it's the best part of being drunk to sit down and share it, to pour your guts out to one another, which is what they were doing. It sounded like they had gotten together to say fuck you to Marie. Maybe not. I had had a run-in with her a few years previous, just before she got married. Everyone's a lesbian, I think. Except for fags, and a few of them are, too. Marie wanted to have kind of a fake affair with me. I just wanted to fuck her, but I felt I was kind of a repulsive drunk to her. I had a girlfriend like that once, too, who just wanted to have a big romance with me in public and would ice me privately. It's a very confusing turn-on. Anyhow, there was obviously a big gaping hole, Marie-shaped, between these two people. They had lived in the Berkshires for several years and would reappear in New York as hippies from time to time and give readings that you knew were just the sort of readings they had been giving in the 60s. There was kind of a group posture, hands on hips, that the others would occasionally slip into, too, when they weren't on guard. It kind of made you feel grateful that time had stood still for someone so you could really see it. Even by the 70s, people had started to want to look rich, and these guys didn't even know about it. A lot of my way of surviving, it seemed, was to get involved with these families. None of them talked to each other anymore, or maybe they had professional relationships, but they all secretly seemed to think that they were doing it wrong, or were doing it the best, or were the only ones still doing it. It was hard to know what it was. It's hard for everyone to grow up, and I think for heterosexuals, it starts when they have kids, and there's an outside to their romance now, which is not their friends, and seems to be a reason not to stop. To go on seems to be about addressing something outside of yourself all the time. I love sitting there hearing about their it. These people were so disoriented. New York had changed a lot in 14 years or however long they were gone. She got a job, that's why they came back, and they had a huge apartment that they complained about all the time, how expensive it was, etc. I think they were the first people who I ever heard use the word gentrification. They were against it. <laughs> My position was, who cared if you had no money all the time? I asked Marie about this once, and she said it just meant there were more pastry shops and she liked pastries. <coughs> Marie drove them nuts. When I was leaving that night, we were all pretty blasted. Grace had always seemed pretty shy to me. She was kind of pinky-faced, which was sweet in a woman pushing 35. She drank a lot, so every now and then I had seen her looped, and she would say things like, the language poets hate me now. <laughs> or something indicative of her fears. But I had heard in her former incarnation as a female poet in New York, she was a real slut and had this one boyfriend for years and fucked everyone in her workshop and horrified Marie and everyone else and liked having a little cult around herself. Now, I would never willingly participate in something like that around another woman. I worshipped Alice, that was different. I was hot for Marie, but the Grace thing seemed to me about some kind of male intellectual power. I didn't like her work. It just went on and on because she was an orphan. I liked his work better. He was an easy man, so it seemed, but he got stuck with the kids when they came back to town, so he was probably needier, and you were nice to him for that. Often I would see him on First Avenue, and it got to be a fun fantasy to think about going home and fucking him, not because I was attracted to him, but because it would kind of make me male, and I thought he would like that too. I've read about wolves and their kind of submission, all kind of grinning and stooped, but the problem is wolves never really submit, so it's just this meaningless performance. It's a big fake grin, and I wonder what was behind Keith's. I remembered encountering him one day, one particular day, in a flurry of snowflakes, and later such a day turned up in one of his poems, so I am convinced that many of us do live in each other's worlds. I guess it's a belief that makes me feel less alone, but also pretty paranoid. I have a crush on both of you, I said, in lieu of good night. 
I feel like Keith said grace again, like earlier on the phone. But anyhow, I was in their bed right away. It was great. They were both getting to be unfaithful at the same time. And I was getting to be fucked in a new bed in a house with kids, which seemed sleazy and sweet at the same time. It wasn't like I was ruining their marriage. I was expanding it. <laughs> Instantly, I was in love with Grace. She seemed to be such a lesbian. She would go, Keith, look, as if I was the first woman who ever had a cunt. If you have any doubts about your femaleness, existentially, I mean, then this is the greatest thrill. Not red hot, but something else. Being in bed with a married couple isn't like menage. It's more like being a child. They had two kids. No, they had three. Two girls and a baby boy. Instantly, I was a fixture and would get up and make the kids toast and watch cartoons with them. Keith and Grace loved sleeping in, and I adored having children to hang out with. I really wanted to look at their drawings. I liked their clothes. Their toys and things were strewn everywhere. The place was a mess. Our mornings were purple and tan. That was the feeling, kind of wooden and royal. The kids were the reason Keith and Grace had dinner, so obviously they were the power in the family, the real power, and so I felt a deep connection to the situation when I attended to them. Garth, the baby, was so new that Grace was still nursing. This was amazing. It's one thing to suck a woman's breast when you are female. I mean, it's the absolute best thing from either end of the equation, but I beg you to consider sucking the breast of a woman who has milk in them. It was almost too scary to do. And naturally, soon after, I was sitting in a cafe with a group of people I didn't know too well, and one of them, this guy, was arguing for the joys of what? Being a man, I think? <laughs> Straight guys always think that's what lesbians are vying for. Have you ever, he sort of leered towards me, sucked a woman's breasts when she was nursing? <laughs> the women with him shrieked, oh, Larry. He looked me in the eye. <laughs> He looked me in the eye, it's really great. I would be doing myself and you an injustice if I didn't admit I, I fell madly in love with her. Maybe the worst ever. Most of my lovers have been younger than me and this woman was maybe five years older, but she was in several important anthologies and she had three kids <laughs> and a job that was important in my world. We all kept it secret, our affair, for quite a while and that was the most fun part, I think. Writers together are ludicrous and dangerous. We sought literary precedents for what we were doing. I think Bloomsbury is what we came up with. Keith did most, most of our research being home all day. Grace would go off to work and we would drink more coffee and he would scramble a couple of eggs. We would begin to smoke and then I felt I had to go. It was like having a boyfriend. It was scary, though I liked him very much. He would cajole me to stay. It never felt exactly sexual, but how could it not wind up there? None of us ever had sex alone. I tried desperately to get her, but it seemed like leaving her marriage was what our sex would mean. He would try and convince me I was not a lesbian. Then why was I fucking him? Well, for one thing, he had a vasectomy. It would be impossible to say, I love your wife. So I was silent in my own defense. Or merely replied, I am. She would go into the kitchen. I'd come behind to hug her while she prepared food. A woman in the kitchen is completely hot, especially if she's not me would send him out to get more beer and make out furiously in the kitchen. He'd stroll in and we'd include him, of course, to make things okay. Any separate arrangements would be unfaithfulness to someone. We all leaked it slowly, but once everybody knew it was different. I missed the good old days when we couldn't get over ourselves. I guess it, I felt it was less about me once the world knew. Guys would kind of get lecherous with me and I'd go and fuck them too. Mostly when I think of her kitchen, I think of bread. A big bag of it with rolls strewn, tumbling out, getting stale in the air. It seemed so outrageous to me, this tiny advertisement of plenty. That's what her sexiness was like. Once in a while, I'd walk with her up First Avenue in her old world way, stopping at different stores. No matter how many tumbled rolls I'd spotted this morning, she'd buy another bunch and throw that bag on the counter too when she got home. Because she drank beer from morning to night, there was always a refrigerator full of rolling rock. The kids were always dr drinking juice, everyone was smoking, and occasionally Keith would indulge with me in a couple of pills. For him it was dangerous, and she would beg me to stop supplying him with them, because then he and I would be even more adamant that we stay up till four or five, and she had to get up in the morning to work, and someone had to walk the kids to school. Also, I think he got kind of nasty when he was speeding when they were alone. He didn't need to drink with his pills like I did. Pills alone can make you mean. I felt like I was right between them doing both. 
One night early on, we took some photographs of us all nude, of course, lying around in bed. They came out great. I was delighted because you couldn't tell what sex I was. I mean, you could, but I looked like a guy. Then they had them developed as slides, and the babysitter, a nice girl named Common, found them. You have a very interesting life, she told Grace one night before she went home. Some poets who were babysat saw them too. It seemed like simple revelation wasn't enough. We needed to give proof. You had to see us as lovers. She would often look like she was weeping when she had to get up. I found that very moving. I'd go and see her at work during the day and would go out into the hallway with the big window and she'd look out that window into the wintry mid-afternoon and smoke and look exhausted. I'd get her to go for drinks with me sometimes at night and I would be really loaded saying, please, 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 but I don't remember what I was begging her for. To leave him and come away with me, what a deal. They bought my cigarettes. They were completely nice and generous. When I first met them, I was doing phone interviews someplace in the 30s at night. I was asking people if they knew what a VCR was. Nobody did. <laughs> there was a lot of drinking going on at work. People would be fired for drinking martinis out of frap cups. I quit that job, and I got a job at Paragon selling sneakers. She loved me working there because I would answer the phone saying Paragon, and she wrote a poem for me with that title. I wrote a poem called Wooden Floor and a lot of good poems that wound up in books and a sweet little one called Elk. The hips, the long avenues, if you're going two ways, all you need is one light to move. What does that mean, he said angrily. It's true, I said, you only need one light, he puffed. We showed each other everything we wrote. It was so twisted. Some I think I only showed her. Anyhow, I think I quit Paragon because I was sitting in Union Square Park one afternoon at lunchtime, and I knew I had to quit something, so I quit my job. <laughs> then I really lived off them, which he encouraged me, encouraged me to do, and she disapproved of. We took a vacation together out to Westing Mass. We stayed at the Red Lion Inn. I think the idea was I was this weird-looking nanny. We brought some coke, and things got really mean. Her and I had our first serious conversation about writing. It was almost more disturbing than to have never had it at all. She really believed she was the only one, brilliant woman. Maybe her and I paid too much attention to each other and he got mad. Then she wept and blamed everything on drugs. We visited some old friends of theirs out there and that was fun. Poets I had never met and they seemed very interested in me and I liked that. Then they got it. The guy dug it, the woman disapproved. I remember her bringing us beers on a tray. She was a blonde. I think we went from f September to February. My phone got turned off. It was nice in my apartment, so silent. I'd come home and write poems and then go back for more. He would have had a separate affair with me. She wouldn't. We went to a Christmas party with her old friends. We got really blasted and danced in this crazy circle. That night was really fun. It was about how little shame you had. I ripped the seat in my pants and we kept dancing. I brought them once to hear a band uptown, Ten Pan Alley. This old friend of Barbara Barg's with the best southern accent lifted her glass of whiskey to me down the row of the bar and said, I really like your couple, Arlene. <laughs> One night I decided to pay them back. I had gotten a grant, so I took them to the River Cafe, which at the time was incredibly chic. We got all dressed up. I had gotten him to cut his hair. Whenever he decided he hated me, that haircut made him sad. But he looked pretty good. She was dressed, too, and I wore a suit. We put David Bowie's fashion on the stereo before we left. That was a weird moment. A cab or maybe even a car service swept us off to Brooklyn. Her and I had spent way too long in the bathroom. We were already smashed. I gave him a hand job under the table when we got back, and I think the waiter saw. We were really drunk. Somebody had a rack of lamb, I think Keith. John Belushi was sitting at the table across from us. It was the week before he died, but he looked dead already. <laughs> he was with two women, blondes, and they were all drinking champagne and tall, thin glasses, no food. I think it ended because she was jealous. That was crazy. She thought I was taking her husband from her. You're kidding. I don't want him. It didn't matter. She was jealous. I came back one day, maybe a month later. I was broke, so I called Keith. I had five blue pills, and he said he would buy them. It was such a scene when I arrived. He doesn't need pills, she murmured through a crack in the door. And then she let me in. Their whole house had been rearranged. Keith had thrown his back out. Their big, huge bed was in the middle of the room, and he was in it, raging. 
His hair had grown long. It was so Dostoevsky. The kids were there. They stared at me like I was a ghost or a clown. I wasn't. I was their friend. I felt like he had invited me over to humiliate me. I gave him the pills. He gave me five bucks. It was a crude exchange. If the end of one's youth is a thin slice of cheese, I ate mine standing in that room. I was there because I was hungry, that's all. So now it's poetry time. So I'm gonna skip around. Um, not around the room, but around this book. So this is called The Honey Bear. Billie Holiday was on the radio. I was standing in the kitchen smoking my cigarette of this pack I planned to finish tonight, last night of smoking youth. I made a cup of this funny kind of tea I've had hanging around, a little too sweet, an odd mix. My only impulse was to make it sweeter. Ivy Anderson was singing pretty late tonight in my very bright kitchen. I'm standing by the tub feeling a little older, nearly 30 in my very bright kitchen tonight. I'm not a bad-looking woman, I suppose. Oh, it's very quiet in my kitchen tonight. I'm squeezing this plastic honey bear, a noodle of honey dripping into the odd sweet tea. It's pretty late. Honey bear's cover was loose and somehow honey dripping down the bear's face, catching in the crevices beneath the bear's eyes. Oh, very sad and sweet. I'm standing in my kitchen. Oh, honey, I'm staring at the honey bear's face. This one's called Along the Strand. We're in the 70s now, and this is for a poet named Steve Levine. When I was a Coke dealer, I just snorted all the profits, or like the time I fell in love with morning. It was something I could stay with. I would stick around, but it slipped into noon, and again I fell in love. At twilight, I was meditative and prayerful, and by night, I was truly in love with someone I could not see. The person who invented inventions was the same one who waited to see what everyone was requesting, and then she invented inventing. I tasted that once, but now it is no longer new. The countermen placing chairs atop tables, the tables are clean, and the radio plays all the new songs. What night was it that you told me how the last time you felt this way, you just walked and walked? Well, I'm the ghost of the coffee shops who started smoking very late. My father told me they cause cancer, and I still believe they cause cancer. There's something wonderful about plastic tables that resemble wood, and I'm dreaming of a tree by a stream that resembles plastic, for I'm inventing again. And I am walking backwards. I grow deeply religious as a child, and as a well-adjusted nun, I am grateful to the child who grew me. I'm grateful to Dad's tip-off concerning cigarettes and believing in denouement. Your footsteps have stopped. You are gladly resting on your couch. Vouching for the honesty of mourning, he left me, became someone else who I found beneath a plastic tree at noon. Vigorous twilight is our resting place, and we will exchange glowing photos in the night. Invention produces pools, and they are not in demand. I am endlessly walking, and a solid-colored day is more to my liking. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. The singing voice produces color, shades her day. She is a nun of my love who draws bands of smoke, which is prayer. I snorted all the prophets. I sleep on a pillow, which is my nose. I find it very religious. My mother taught me sex was dirty, which was exciting. She taught me love is romantic. I didn't start fucking till quite late. Exciting, romantic, I'm quite sure it is the one thing I've invented. The times of the day, the ones with names, they are the stripes of sex, unlike romance, who dream like is a continuous walker. Obviously, a solid colored day is unexciting. I bring my best romance to morning. I bring my best romance to noon. Night, the old chama is in love with candles, holds a fistful of morning behind his back. So you are no longer walking, and this is no particular cigarette. A beautiful nun may be dreaming my life, or I am inventing again. In ancient Greece, a mystical child examines three ribbons. The oldest woman in this part of town is aware of her hair, black, white, and gray. Even as she lay dying, if, even as she first fucked, and her lover's words caressed her like smoke, inventing pools in her gorgeous and tangled black hair. Okay, so this is, I mentioned punk before. This is the other punk thing I've ever done. It's a poem called On the Death of Robert Lowell. 
And it, it was basically like when Lowell died, it was that this horrible thing where everybody was like, oh, Robert Lowell. And they said all these beautiful things about him and how he looked walking through Harvard Yard and the wind hitting his hair. He was so fabulous. And it just seemed like I was in my 20s and I just thought, you know, it's like, forget po when they're dead, who cares? It's like we should praise poets when they live, right? And so I thought to, the way to make that point, of course, was to trash this man. Who I, it was a perfectly nice man who was like marching in peace marches and, you know. Oh, I don't give a shit. He was an old white-haired man, insensate beyond belief and filled with much anxiety about his imagined pain. Not that I'd know. I hate fucking wasps. The guy was a loon. Signed up for spring semester at McLean's, a really lush retreat among pines and hippie attendants. Ray Charles also once rested there. So did James Taylor. The famous, as we know, are nuts. Take Robert Lowell, the old white-haired coot, fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> there were like people who still hate me for this poem. I was just like, I was, I was young, it was true. And, and this is the last from the seven. It's called Texas. I'm nearly crying for it, looking for the large, looking at the large colored map on his wall. Poor Texas looking big as life and dying to secede. Mama, did Annie Oakley ever cry? Or mother, is it true she couldn't cry? That's why she could shoot so well? Oh, Mama, I just want to cry sitting here looking at Texas across the face of the map, so big and so lonely. I just want to get a BB gun and shoot that fucking state to bits. And this one's called Holes. We're in the 80s now. Once when I passed East 4th Street off 1st Avenue, I think it was in early fall, and I had a small hole in the shoulder of my white shirt and another on the back, I looked just beautiful. There was a whole moment in the 70s when it was beautiful to have holes in your shirts and sweaters. By now it was 1981, but I carried that 70s style around like a torch. There was a whole way of feeling about yourself that was more European than American, unless it was American around 1910, when it was beautiful to be a strong, starving immigrant who believed so much in herself, and she was part of a movement as big as history, and it explained the hole in her shirt. It's the beginning of summer tonight, and every season has cracks through which winter or fall might leak out. The most perfect flavor of it, oddly, in June. I remember when I was an immigrant. I took a black beauty and got up from the pile of poems around my knees and just had too much energy for thought and walked over to your house where there was continuous beer. Finally, we were just drinking Rheingold, a hell of a beer. At the door, I mentioned I had a crush on both of you, what you say to a couple. By now, the kids were in bed. I can't even say clearly now that I wanted the woman, though it seemed to be the driving principle then, wanting one of everything. I was part of a generation of people who went to the bars on 7th Street and drank the cheap whiskey and the ale on tap and dreamed about when I would get you alone, those big breasts. I carried slim notebooks which only permitted two or three word lines. I need you, nearing the horse. There was blood in all my titles and milk. I had two bright blue pills in my pocket. I loved you so much. It was the last young thing I ever did, the end of my renaissance and immigration into my dream world, which even my grandparents had not dared to live, being prisoners of schizophrenia and alcohol, though I was lovers with the two. The beauty of the story is that it happened. It was the last thing that happened in New York. Everything else happened while I was stopping it from happening. Everything else had a life of its own. I don't think I owe them an apology, though at least one of their kids hates my guts. She can eat my guts for all I care. I had a small hole in the front of my black sleeveless sweater. It was just something that happened. It got larger and larger. I liked to put my finger in it. In the month of December, I couldn't get out of bed. I kept waking up at 6 p.m., and it was Christmas or New Year's, and I had to start drinking and eating. I remember you handing me the most beautiful red plate of pasta. It was like your cunt on a plate. I met people in your house, even found people to go out and fuck, regrettably, not knowing about the forbidden fruit. I forget what the only sin is, somebody told me recently. I have so many holes in my memory between me and the things I'm separated from. I pick up a book and another book and memory and separation seem to be all anyone writes about, or all they seem to let me read. But I remember those beautiful holes on my back like a beautiful cloak of feeling. It was kind of fun to tell the same story twice. <laughs> This is called um, New England Wind. Remember me this summer under the 
eaves again, stretched out against the sky again like Orion's moon. When a breeze crawls down a screen, pip sing, or is that a cat crawling up? Or was I alone in the first room I ever had, or who would have writ this then? Me too, when I am mad. Oh, leave me alone, my aching head, panicky, panicky, nowhere to go, pretty north and silly. The other night, under the eaves, in a rain at four o'clock, I woke up, it was so sexy, listened so careful in the world the next day, for who also heard it, dreamy-eyed, who could have come up or I come down for once from the sky to be what fell? And this is called, and then the, the weather arrives. I don't know no one anymore who's up all night. Wouldn't it be fun to hear someone really tired come walking up your stairs and knock on your door? Come here and share the rain with me, you. Isn't it wonderful to hear the universe shudder how old it all, everything, must be? How slow it goes, steaming coffee, marvelous morning, the tiny hairs on the tree's arms coming visible? I like it better, no one knows sweetness, moving your lips in silence, closing your eyes all night. It's so much better disarming myself from terror and light passing through a painting I stuck on a window earlier when I was scared. It's great, it's really great. Trees hold, hold the world and the weather moves slow. Even a body dissolves and takes a place incorrectly everywhere I would like to nuzzle and plants a heart in the world voiceless. I began knocking, ridiculous, just to hear your echo back, arm against face, just to stop those fucking trucks, my thoughts are vanishing into that sweetness. And this one's called November. Because I'm sure that nothing lasts, I have to be very sure where I am. I can hear the dripping of the faucet and the cries of little birds outside, and I have to be very sure that I love, because I'll never feel like this again, and I'm sure that I love. I'm sure I'm closing in on something. The building isn't making that angle of light for me, but I can see it. It silences the cat, but it doesn't silence me. That's why I let the cat be around. My landlord doesn't think my way. I couldn't be like that. I'm sure that I love. Obviously, my heart lies clenched in my fists. I must be feeling or thinking this way. This poem's bad. It wants to think or tell about how it's felt, but it just seems to beat along between punches and silence. I have to be very sure where I am. I'm telling you so. If it weren't for telling, I'd be left with the plumbing and birds where I am, but I'm telling you so. I thoroughly respect the birds because they're not even listening. I do. I like them a lot for their poverty and lack of thought. I love myself for my love, a dubious gift, and I guess I need those fucking pipes. Simplicity, that's that. I guess I love you and I need you, love telling you that. I have to be very sure where I am, listening and waiting. I wish you'd call and tell me something. My landlord wants to know where I'm at, but I'm telling you that nothing lasts. It doesn't silence me, but it silences the cat. I have to be very sure where I am. And then we're going to go into the 90s now. If you don't get, like, bubbles in your blood, it happens too fast. Um, this is called shh. I don't think I can afford the time to not sit right down and write a poem about the heavy lidded white rose I hold in my hand. I think of snow. A winter night in Boston, drunken waitress stumble on a bus that careens through Somerville, the end of the line where I was born, an old man shaking me. He could have been my dad. You need a ride? Wait, he said. This flower is so heavy in my hand. He drove me home in his old blue Dodge, a thermos next to me, cigarette packs on the dash, so quiet like Boston is quiet, Boston in the snow. It's New York, plates are clattering on St. Mark's Place. Should I call you? Can I go home now and work with this undelivered message in my fingertips? It's summer. I love you. I'm surrounded by snow. And this is sort of, I guess this is still kind of 90s, and we're just, um, it's a book called Skies. So this is all, all the book was doing, which was sort of like treating weather. I mean, the poet James Schuyler is, is, is 
you know, sort of huge for me as a writer of all sorts. And he, uh, if you ever read his diaries, he had the capacity to write about weather moving through a house as if it were art. You know, it's a phenomenal thing. So I, I wanted to use the sky like art. And so then my rule for this book was simply that, that a poem, like a, a cloud just had to hit someplace in every poem. And that's all the poem had to do. So 20 years ago in May, no, don't do that. Look at the crinkly peach of the sky in Chelsea today. A man's foot hits the curb with the phone at his ear. It's dog walking time, but mine are away. I see a gleam of cream behind the faintest netting of trees, breeze, whistling traffic, barely wet hair from the gym, that plane overhead and it's orange again. And this is called weather. I had already begun being a woman who had lived mostly alone going, huh, and piping, shuffling through the rest of her time. I contain a running kid, a green elf. I am entirely alone. I desire a certain sports car, a drippy night, making hairpin turns in Rome. Your face beams up like a million jiggling suns. Do you get it? Go. What you know is true. I am so long gone down my road. The cat is in the bag. I leave the bag where it is so the cat can get in it and dream for a very long time while the rest of my building purrs. He slipped his head into the bag's handles and sniffly and gently sniffs it. Well then money, well then love. And this one's called weather. I suddenly I started to feel like a DJ. I just I just thought I'll just keep hit, hitting all the weather poems. <coughs> it's called no, it's it's the weather, the weather, and it's for. I went to a um, like a triple birthday. It was like three, three people in the exact same world all had the same birthday. They're all poet art writers too. For Alan, Monica, and Francis. For the most compelling birthday party I'd been to in a while, I bought three cards. Thinking that I heard a wet and sparkling sound, three pipes spurting water, standing in the park quite near to the corner I meet you on, I go past. I don't know what tonight will deliver, the t-shirt you'll wear, an attachment I'm proud of not knowing you again, like that water I've lived here for a while. What do you think I should say in these cards? I'm as excited about this moment as I was in the beginning. I keep seeing women in the street who resemble my mother, her wide Christian face. Is it an abomination to put that in a poem to my lover, not so much to you as with you in it, in the same world of the card, the train ride into Brooklyn, cars turning, skateboards splash, hard the plastic of the wrong side, hitting the pavement. All you see are cops and cars and their vans prowling like a city full of meth or a whole middle of a country like a split. Every woman your age, cute. Every woman my age, wounded and glisten. That like pissed that girlfriend off so much. She was like, I hate that poem. Do you have to read that? Um, this is like the first, like there's a, a new and a selected part of this book. So this is the first new poem. And it's called, What Tree Am I Waiting? That whole part of the world where I won't go anymore, that whole separation that I won't feel, high in this house, in this hemisphere, in this artificial light that is artificial in the earliest morning, dark, in pages and pens, in an unfamiliar bed, in the foot curl, furniture, each rumble when morning comes, and it's still morning, and it's still night. I married a dead girl. We were born in her bloom. Remember that fat bumblebee landed on a lamp? I opened the doors, and I forgot, and the house got colder and colder. Where is this house? The seam between boards merely gains my attention. It's dark and thin. I monitor each situation, my bladder growing full. Climb down, climb up. What tree am I waiting my whole life in weather, waiting for my raft? I'll fly to another island. I'll take a train. Already I know it will hurt. 
This is the hurt country. I came here to hold the hurt like a bird, like a tree. Traffic has rings. We watch it whirl around, damaging our night. Great continents hold the feelings in the ages. What is mine going blind? Great masses of them not going home. The country drew a line because of memory. One said, I feel my heart race ahead. In eternity, there is this ache. There is this wakefulness. Well... In all the years I lived in New York until he died, like Alan was like, Alan Ginsberg was like the big poet, and sort of later on in his career, he started to do, to do this like harmonium thing, like he would bring this little baby um, organ or accordion up on stage, and we're like, why was he doing that, you know? He was so into like blues and stuff, and um, I finally have got it with the blues. The blues are great, you know, but I was like, when I was a kid, I was like, it's horrible. Why would you want to listen to that, you know? So this is, I have, I have written one blues poem, and it's called Harmonica. Don't want to put my glasses on, because I don't want to see. Don't want to move again, because I don't want to live. Don't want to love again, because I don't want to lose. Don't want to eat again, because I don't want to be full. Don't want to drink again, because I don't want to feel quenched. Don't want to sleep again, because I don't want to wake up. Don't want to live in the summer again, because I don't want to be hot. Don't want you to kiss me again because I don't want to be alive. Don't want to see you again because I don't want to vanish. Don't want to ride my bike because I don't want to get there. Don't want to know my family anymore because I don't want to remember me. Don't want to walk my dog because I don't want to be out. Don't want to stay in anymore because I don't want to be alone. Don't want to be tired anymore because I don't want to feel old. Don't want to eat candy anymore because I don't want to feel sweet. Don't want to talk to my friends anymore because I don't want them to know me. Don't want to sing anymore because I don't want to hear me. Don't want to die anymore because I don't want to see God. Don't want to live anymore because I don't want to repeat. And I'm going to read one more poem. It's called That Rat's Death. <laughs> and I, for some reason I want to share two facts, one of which is that um, I like, came to like Kafka really late. Like when I was in college in the 60s and everybody was walking around with this like red and black, the trial. And I was like, I don't want to read The Trial. I don't want to read Kafka. So it was just like years passed. I just finished a, a, like a, a fantastic memoir about a dog. And so when somebody learned that I was writing this book, they were like, have you read Kafka's story, The Mouse Singer? Which is an amazing story about a, like a, sm a mouse opera singer. It's an, an astonishing story. And so since then, I've been like, Kafka is incredible. I'm like going around, have you read Kafka? He's great. <laughs> He's like, I, feel like, I feel like the stupidest person in New York, you know? So, but I don't know. I read, I read Middlemarch last, last month. I was like, incredible book. <laughs> I was, you know, world literature. It's in English, you know? It's like incredible new area. So this is that rat's death. And, and so, yeah, the mice, then we, you know, the mice are here. And it was also like a pseudo, as you write, as you write love poems and you write breakup poems, and then you, you write a breakup poem and then you don't break up and you like have to like hide it. It's like a forbidden text for like a year and a half. <laughs> and they sort of see a little poem called that rat. It was like, what is that? I was like, you know, it's not a good poem. Like, you know, so. I'm proud that I fed my avocado to the mice this week. To see that scattered dust around the hole, I felt disappointed the apple had been spared the throbbing soup home. He said, it's a storm. It's a storm, I thought. Am I allowed to ask entire questions to take this space alone? You bobbing, you painted in my dog's face so carefully. Some kind of violence stretches the thought so long and allows the horns of words to touch each other. I think of him taking that much space. You don't know about this dish towel, for that matter. Who was I in another time giving the tale so much, puzzled that these spices went someplace else they did today in a sandwich? The empty hall into which I am reading, the empty country, an entire country, I wanted all of them. How I would like just one to pick things up in its cities and its rain, its coast, the outer coat. 78 RPM, silly newspapers turning, cat on a porch in other countries nearby and home ready for me when I have something to say or show if ever. My empty mistakes, my empty vase, my empty powers of horror, my empty sex. Oh, bring the snow. That rat's death killed me because I would see it for days, over and over. It hardly could be the same rat whose insides whisk the street. 
We don't think that war is such an incredible mess, but it was just yesterday in an ancient poem years ago in the past. Dying, the balloon just burst. It cannot bring you back again. The huge cool breath, the lake doesn't want you anymore, or her arms, her sweet muff or breast, the storm, the past. But no, I won't leave my cheese out for them anymore, and I must be the last person in the world in New York to read him who told us about mice that sing and fill empty auditoriums like us and our singing hearts, our formula for bringing it out, pulling the receptacle apart, watch the tiny ship floating on it, smithereens. I duck the tail edging over, taking a little bit more. The price of wider concepts is not choosing your drops, oh, flicking me off, reminding me of you, everyone yell at once, two rabbit legs jutting out. I keep my childhood around almost more than everyone, and a mouse can share my house wet toot tootsie. It's kind of great the whole thing is relative since I admired his mountains. I imagined I was in his landscapes, but opening packages is occurring all over the place. That's a strong image, and I feel like the smallness is directly rooted. Forgetting to use the new calendar I planned. These marks, I imagined, are the sources all the milk flooding wildly all over the rolling hills and out the sun's comical eyes. Not tears, but creamy drops of mammalian weather. I'm given real information, and the most difficult part is blindly creating the space where the parts I can't see or even hear are spread out like the night in Paris when I walk to the movies, onto my desk in the surrounding hills, into the bleachers where everyone is pounding themselves bloody in salute to the hunt. All I ever wanted was dinner, or at least his love, the delight I see, and him is equally empty for anyone, and probably that's his stealth in her lake. There's a car, a maroon, a colorless oval. I can imagine the seats and the feeling of hearing a song as we're weaving over hills. There's no break. Everybody I ever saw in my seat coast community is already facing the problems, huge and gloomy, I grant you, and the night spills on my keys, which are splayed over the counter, and outside it's light. They are flipping their cards, every one of them. Thank you.